share. Uh, welcome everyone. It is uh, Wednesday, August 16th, 10 a.m. Eastern. This is the Aperio Teaching and Learning Meeting. And uh, so welcome everyone. Um, our main uh, topics today are to have a discussion um, in uh, uh, Sakai on the group locking feature. And Josh uh, from Longsight is going to facilitate that in five to ten minutes. And then we're going to have a discussion on the syllabus tools uh, discussion, ask some provocative questions about the Sakai syllabus tool. Um, and we have some of those questions in there, and we can take off from there. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet. It'd be cool if uh, you all wouldn't mind signing up. And uh, we'll start with uh, announcements, project updates and announcements. It'd be really great if somebody would mi wouldn't mind um, typing in some notes uh, for this. Uh, first of all, before I uh, do some updates, I'm curious if anybody else has updates that I'd like to give. Like Wilma, did you have anything, for example, on Sakai virtual conference you wanted to mention, or? Um, I think we are. Did we already announce the date? We sent out the save the date, right? Yes, we did. But for those of you who may not have seen it, um, the virtual conference is going to be on November 14th. That's a Tuesday. Um, so that's uh, that's what we're planning for the day of the event, and hopefully we'll be getting the um, call for proposals out soon. So um, if you think that you might want to present something, or if you know somebody at your institution that has a great topic that would be good to share with the rest of the Sakai community, um, please encourage them to uh, submit once we get that uh, call for proposals out. And like I said, that should be coming out soon, so keep an eye out for it. Thanks, Wilma. And um, is there anything else? Oh, yeah. There was. Uh, what about um, mentioning the different ways people can can um, volunteer to help? Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> like we could certainly use some help documenting if anybody um, wants to help update uh, documentation for Sakai 12. So that project is underway. And uh, we definitely need more, need more helpers uh, updating the help. So if you're interested, let me know. Thank you. you yeah, and I QA assistance that could be needed, Neil. If you want to talk yeah, about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'll mention that and a little bit about Sakai 12 and where it stands. So um, Wilma, I was I was thinking also for Sakai Virtual Conference that we have opportunities for people to volunteer just to moderate sessions like if they didn't want to if they didn't have time and energy to put into the planning group which we're still i think welcome anyone who would like to help us out with the planning um there's there's smaller ways that you can help in the sakai virtual conference which is that each session we like to have a moderator to sort of introduce the speaker make sure it's being recorded that's you know the basic basic stuff timekeeping of when the session ends so um if you want to help out with a Sakai virtual conference, but don't have enough energy to, you know, participate in regular meetings and planning. That's another way you can help out there. Um, Sakai yes, 12 documentation. Thank you for bringing that up. I forgot, sure. but that's a sure. great reminder. Yeah, thank you. Sure, no problem. And um, as Will mentioned, we'll need Sakai 12 documentation help. Um, we like to update the help. Some of it's going to be really easy, just taking new um, screenshots and pasting in the new uh, images because a lot of tools are, are behave the same as they did. Others will be updating, uh, adding new to any new tools that were added to Sakai, creating new documentation, updating existing documentation to make sure it's accurate um, and uh, things like that. So every little bit that somebody can help, that's like the online documentation in Sakai, every little bit really helps a lot. Um, and um, Sakai 12 QA is also something we're going to need a lot of. Actually, I was going to ask for people to let me know or the Sakai QA group know as a whole um, what your availability is to help with Sakai 12. Sakai 12 timeline, uh, what we're shooting for, we're planning to do a branch, I hope, this week, branching, you know, creating an actual Sakai 12 and QA instance. Um, I think we got a good shot at it. If not, it would probably be early next week. And, um, and then we have about two months to do the majority of our QA testing, which is pretty tight time frame for a major release um, from our experience. And the reason we need to get about a two month time frame there is because if we get something done with Sakai 12, we get to what we call an RC01, which is our first release candidate by mid-October, 
we can probably get a release out by um, before Thanksgiving. And uh, uh, if we can get a release out before Thanksgiving, that would be ideal because once we get into the holiday season, that's US Thanksgiving, right? Fourth November, fourth Thursday in November. Because once we get into the holiday season, um, resources drop off a lot. And then um, it pushes things out quite a bit more than, than it typically would otherwise. And then we're hoping to get a 12.1 or maybe even a 12.2 out so that people wanting to go to 12 uh, over the, you know, by next summer um, have a good leg up on that. So very tight timeline. And it would be very, very helpful to know, you know, I know that a lot of schools are involved in back to school activities for, um, you know, for the upcoming semester and um, maybe can't participate in, Q in QA. So it would be nice to know, oh, we would like to participate, but we can't right now. Maybe we can jump in in a month or something like that, just to get a sense of the amount of resources available for QA, because QA is also a very big factor in the how fast we can release, um, you know, get the new release out. If we don't have enough QA resources, then that's going to push things out as well. So that's the kind of the Sakai 12 thing. So Sakai 12 targeting about a two-month window for intensive QA. And we're going to provide a lot of different levels of QA opportunities. Um, we're going to try and make a really easy, the QA planning team is working on a way to make it really easy. So if all you have is like an hour here or an hour there or your colleagues, um, that you can easily jump in and just you know get something actually productive done in about an hour or so. Um, if you have more time and more uh, and are available to to offer more then we have you know sort of for more advanced testers who have more experience and more time uh, to help us in certain aspects of, of QA um, so that's kind of how we're thinking about things so more more will be coming on that on the email list um, and then we have Sakai you know then there's there's so many announcements in fact I'm working on, I'm thinking I'm gonna do need to do a blog post because there's just so much going on in the community um, uh, and it seemed like it might be a nice nice to have a summary of the things that are happening, like Sakai Camp Light that's uh, probably occurring for a one-day mini little meeting at uh, probably at Duke University, and Dr. Chuck Severance is going to be there, and um, you know other folks, and it looks like we'll have a nice small group there. And I'm not sure, you know, um, uh, there's Sakai Camp we're planning on for January 21st or 25th. So there's a ton of things going on in the community. Um, there's also a big effort to have a, a Perio presence at Eli, which is the um, Educause Learning Initiative. And there could be, you know, this really exciting presentation that that um, Laura Geckler is, is uh, going to submit for a panel discussion. Um, so really, really a lot of cool stuff going on. But I'll stop and see if anyone has any questions and sorry to take up so much time but like I said just just a lot going on <clears throat> and I'm sure I missed some things too so any other announcements or any questions okay I don't see anything in the chat so Trisha do you want to uh, take it away or Okay. So really, I'm mostly going to turn it over to Josh. Josh, I'm going to um, screen share the JIRA that um, we're going to be talking about and let you lead us in this discussion. And I also have a tab open to the um, Google Doc um, discussion about this. So where do you want me to start for you? Um. Well, that's. I would say let's let's start with the Google Doc, and we can uh, we can go back to the Jira. <clears throat> I mean, we have we have five to ten minutes for this, and it's not a, a five to ten minute conversation. Um, but I just wanted to a. I wanted to say hi because some of you guys I haven't met before. I am uh, officially the new guy at Longsite that's been abbreviated NGAL. I'm the new uh, vice president for uh, um, operations and planning. Previously, I was associate CIO for academic technology at Brandeis University in Massachusetts, where I'm still located. So Brandeis was a was it was a Moodle school, so I'm very well aware of open source and uh, an open source lover. But on the other hand, it's been really really exciting to get involved with this community and see how active and passionate it is. So the the backdrop for me inserting myself on this particular question is uh, as as the new guy Sam Ottenhoff asked me if I would you know, maybe find some way to offer some, some insights to help us see the way forward. 
I don't think I have any on my own, but what I think would be useful for us to do maybe is to go back to basics and figure out what some of the, the pedagogical use cases might be that would inform what we do with group locking. Because the my read of the, the JIRA ticket is that uh, there are a lot of us putting out a lot of ideas and there are a lot of good ideas, but it's difficult to see the way forward. So, you know, I was hoping that we could have mostly a process discussion about trying to organize ourselves to uh, get the feedback that we need to see the way forward. Anyway, so that's putting all of my cards on the table. Um, I'm happy to start either with uh, looking at the JIRA ticket or at the discussion starter, whichever folks would prefer. Um, Josh, uh, maybe you could summarize the JIRA so that we understand what's being proposed. Or maybe sure. that's in your doc. I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to. It, it is in the Google Doc at a, at a ridiculously high level. Um, but, uh, you know, my my sense of things is this, and people who've been way more involved in this for longer than I have, uh, you know, feel free to tell me that I've, I've missed something important. But my sense is that uh, there, there was a problem that was encountered where uh, faculty members, especially in the uh, in the assignments tool, would change up groups or have groups changed on them by uh, by feeds from the, the student systems of record. Um, and suddenly there would be group assignments that would not be traveling appropriately with students who had changed groups or would be orphaned because the group itself was deleted for some reason. There are all sorts of weird behaviors around uh, the changing of groups in the context of assignments particularly, but, but somewhat also tests and quizzes. Um, so to address that, there was a quick fix that locked groups once they had received an assignment. Of course, that, that produces uh, other downstream effects that don't allow faculty members to do what they need to do pedagogically in, in their courses. So the, 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 the JIRA ticket, if you read through it, is a lot of us uh, offering lots of really good ideas about what's needed and what we might do. But it, from my perspective, it tends to be more in the vein of what solutions we might put forth to try and address this. And it doesn't spend a ton of time in, in the, the space of problem definition. I mean, so that's, that's painting with a broad stroke. And certainly some of the posts, uh, you know, do that. Uh, so as I read through, I thought, you know, how could we as people who, well, you guys as people who work directly with faculty um, and other instructors, and me as someone who used to do that in my prior life, um, okay. you know, recently as, as February of this year, when I, when I was last at Brandeis, you know, how, do, how do we get input from faculty and students to help uh, see our way through this complicated discussion? What I would have done at Brandeis is to gather up a few of my uh, faculty partners that I work with most you know, in different disciplines. Some folks contract, some not. Some tenure and tenure track, some not. Uh, you know, making sure that there was a humanist and a social scientist and a fine arts faculty member and a scientist and someone from the professional schools, you know, and have these conversations either individually or in groups saying, all right, you guys teach with groups in your classes. You know, what are the situations that you find yourselves in? Uh, what are the things that you want to accomplish in your classes in those situations? And how can the LMS best enable that? So my, my hope was to try and, uh, you know, get us as a group thinking about how we might develop some of those use cases, working with academic uh, constituents at our, at, at our institutions, your institutions, to try and see a way forward that, that makes sense to all of us. Right. So what I tried to do in the Google Doc was to offer up um, a challenge and a key question. And I, I tried to start populating uh, use, case, use case categories and uh, possible situations within them. This is really only pump priming, and I'm sure that there are there's a lot that you guys can add to this. I was just trying to model a potential approach. So, in in the context of that modeling, you know, how do we develop pedagogical use cases to help us figure out what we need to do in Sakai to best help those use cases be supported? Um, you know, for each of those cases what's the outcome that the instructor wants to achieve and how should Sakai support that? And under that header, I thought, well, all right, so there are manually created groups and there are feed generated groups. Maybe there are other settings. And I thought, I thought about possibilities within each of those headings. So, um, you know, that, that was kind of where my thinking was going. I wanted to stop there for a moment 
and just see what your what your reactions are to taking that approach to try and see this through. So what's your what what is your thinking about that process proposal? I like I like the process. This is Tricia. Um, I like the process that you're um, following here and asking us to engage in. And I think that this is a really a great conversation. Um, it is important to understand what the use cases are, and it's also important on the other side to understand how Sakai handles <laughs> the use cases in in different tools. So just my very brief scan of the JIRA comments, and I noted that Tiffany made quite a few comments, and she regretted that she couldn't be here today, and she really wanted to be part of this conversation. Um, but I think, I think the problem that we're encountering is that assignments <clears throat> handles group stuff a little differently than other tools and and so it essentially is where the biggest problems lie is that a fair statement hello i'm I, well so i'm i'm being silent here waiting for others to chime in on that question oh, okay others might know more than i um, yeah. silence, silence is my friend, you know? Mm -hmm. So anybody else on the call have any um, experience with this issue or uh, comments in general about this process that's being proposed? Come on the mic or um, chat. As, as, as you guys marshal your thoughts, one way to think about this, given that we have five to ten minutes planned and we've uh, consumed most of those ten minutes, one potential outcome for this might be to uh, agree to have a longer conversation about use cases in a forthcoming meeting. You know, essentially to uh, not to, not to kick the can so much, but to agree that this is important to take up, that this process might be worthwhile to take up, and that we could give it a fair shake, uh, you know, from uh, an intellectual and content perspective, with a slightly longer time frame in a later meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I think it makes sense to have a bigger conversation about groups because it's not just groups and assignments that are an issue. There's other behavior and other tools like lessons or tests and quizzes or you know, other places in Sakai where groups um, and the handling of groups might be uh, problematical. So it would be nice to have a consistent way to, to treat groups um, that goes across all the tools. Yeah. I wonder if we need a, we want to do this in a, a teaching and learning call or do we want to have a focus group um, to come together and try to hammer some of this out or is this a bigger conversation that as some of you are are chatting I mean I, I defer to you guys on the venue you know I my, my sense is we would want um, maximum appropriate stakeholder input so the question then becomes uh, how do we get that my my thinking is neil my thinking is that you know if there are people who uh, you know i'm noticing some of the comments are that people are liking the process and liking the use cases and a good place to start and need time to kind of think about it. And other comments are that maybe individual experiences, not everybody goes that deeply with the tools. So I'm wondering if there are some people who do like Tiffany, who's not able to be on the call right now, or other people who have some passion and interest around it to kind of get together, right? And identify three or four or five people. And not that that would exclude, you know, reporting back to the big group or coming back to the teaching and learning group saying, hey, this we went through this thought process and this is where we're heading or landing and get input mm -hmm. about, you know, that point. So that's, that's one approach that sort of comes to me. Would, would this be an appropriate breakout session for a, a Sakai mini camp? 
Yeah, I don't know if we're going to have the right people like at the mini camp uh, and enough people at the mini camp that's happening um, for that to be the best place. I mean, it really depends on who's going to be there and how, and uh, what, this is my thinking. I don't know, you know, if it's absolutely true, but, um, you know, depending how many people and, and who actually shows up and whether, you know, they have the passion around this particular issue. Like if you're talking about the one around um, uh, at Duke in October after all things open, um, I wouldn't, I don't know that I'd wait for a mini camp person. So I'm just giving you my, again, my opinion, but I don't know. I, I, Anyway, I said my my thoughts. So, <laughs> um, one thing that I'll put out there is that we usually do some uh, usability testing at the virtual conference. So this might be a, a topic that could be tested with folks at that event, or potentially um, a birds of a feather session on groups um, would be a really good topic at the conference. So just a little plug for that. Absolutely. <laughs> That's a good idea. Even if the group meets whatever group that is, I'm sure Tiffany will be a part of it and Josh um, and possibly others to sort of hammer this this out. So that's a great suggestion. And then and then they can share more at that and get more input as well as on, you know, another teaching and learning call. There's nothing to say because that's way out in November. And uh, you know, I'm not sure what the, the best way forward is, but some emails and some other um, updates in teaching and learning calls as well seems like a really good idea. So here's here's what I would suggest. Um, I'd suggest we allocate ourselves some time in the next teaching and learning call to, um, you know, to essentially map out a, uh, a more fully fleshed process that includes the, uh, the the groups uh, birds of a feather at the virtual conference maybe other venues so you know what are we'd want to we'd want to marinate in the use cases we'd want to you know define both the process and the the questions and needs for information and, and user research and use that to guide the development of a, of a process that might culminate in November okay so we actually happen to have an uh, opening on September 6th teaching and learning call so why don't we uh, move the rest of this discussion to that date is that a work for you Josh yep sounds great right. that would be at, at, at the same time yes and these calls are every two weeks or every first and third Wednesday okay got it Hey, this is Becky. Um, I don't, I don't really see how to address this, but um, I see a, so this is like a symptom that um, we're having issues where groups is a great one example of it, where we have we work on tools separately, but there's all sorts of ways they interact. And I also we're starting to have some issues with um, dates and times and time zones and how each tool ha can handle some of those situations differently. I'm starting to see that the Kai is maturing and that approaching problems from a tool only um, versus a big picture of how a lot of the tools work together is starting to become a problem. That's kind of my <laughs> sense of things right now. Yeah, that's. I think that's why this approach um, that Josh is proposing is a really good one to start from the use cases and, and you know, really understanding what instructors want and need from groups across whatever activities they're doing. and and then figure out how to make the tools behave properly based on that. Okay, so we are way over time for this um, discussion. And thank you so much, Josh, for um, getting us um, engaged in the conversation around this and we'll spend more time in our next meeting. Thank you guys uh, for taking the time, I appreciate yeah. it. So we'll take the time that we have left to switch to the syllabus tool um, discussion. So if we can switch gears a little bit and hopefully you guys can see my my screen. And we have um, 
these questions uh, that that could help us start thinking about the syllabus tool. And Becky, this kind of goes in the face of what you were just saying because we're focusing on the tool. Um, but um, but it's a wor it's a worthwhile conversation because I know a lot of folks are using lessons now instead of syllabus or um, you know other tools. So um, what do you guys think? We've, our first question here is do we need a discrete syllabus tool? The main advantage, this Terry go lightly, the main advantage I see in a different syllabus tool is that it reminds people that they need to post their syllabus. Right. That's and, true. And that's, that's about it. Um, otherwise, the functions that are in the syllabus tool are pretty well in lessons now that we've got the collapse fillable sections. Right. <clears throat> I know at UVA, um, we have an integration from our syllabus to our student information sy system so that faculty can post um, more information about their course, and that's made available as a link in our student information system. So there's certain permissions set on the syllabus item to make it visible that, from that link. Um, so that would be something we would have to figure out another way to accomplish that if the syllabus tool went away. Lucy noticed, says, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 I was just going to do exactly where you were going, Tricia. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lucy says that um, she used the syllabus on her first course and then lessons came to Oxford and syllabus became redundant. And Dave comments that couldn't you create a lesson template and include it in the course shell called syllabus? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking there are other things that could be added to to lessons, like in the menu to add text. It could also be add syllabus in there. <laughs> That's a great idea. Uh, the thing about syllabus tool and is that what it ends up happening is that faculty attach a PDF or something like that that it that links to a document offline mm -hmm. and they don't learn the tool or they just think that's another tool I have to learn and it, it's not utilized the way it needs to be utilized in order to give the benefit that it has so I think it's clutter frankly yeah I agree it's just one more place that students have to go find stuff. Well, it's one more place that faculty have to say, now what does Sakai want me to do here again? Right, that too. So let's see, I'm going back to the chat um, and some of it's slipping away. Let's see, Jennifer says in the new Sakai 11, um, we go to it, we'll show faculty how to add their course. Many are just putting in resources. And that's true for us, too. And I know Charles said that was true for them. Uh, to me, it's, Lucy says, it's more a template, how you maintain consistency across courses rather than the need for a specific tool. And Neil says, I have NGDLE comments when and if appropriate. Okay. So um, let's just read out Kyle's comment here. That's a good point, Dave. However, we find that a lot of faculty, particularly those who are less technologically inclined or less interested in customizing their course sites, are averse to building out content in the lessons tool. They like the idea of a syllabus tool, but in its current state, it is just too difficult. They just want to upload a PDF and have it be embedded on the screen. Yep. So many ways to post the syllabus, says Laura, Sierra, and I've lost that.
our faculty either post the PDF on their overview page, add a web content link, or simply post in resources. So a lot of these comments are just flying by. I don't know how useful it is for me to read them all, but I do want to capture them in the recording. Having a separate tool provides a consistent place for instructors. The nice thing with lessons, says Dave, is because you can require students to read the page and you can't set those prereqs on the syllabus tool itself. Well, that's a good point. So I'm just going to make and a pitch. Sorry, go ahead. Yes, yeah. go ahead. For people who have microphones, just jump in and, and talk. That would be so much better than me reading your comments and having to try to scroll up and down as the um, chat window jumps around. <laughs> Please, I see all of you, or most of you, have microphones. Use them. I just want to point out that you can catch the chat if you right-click in the chat window and select to save all the text. Yeah, but it doesn't get, when, we, when I upload it to YouTube, it doesn't get captured in the YouTube. No, but you can at least make a text copy of it and have it recorded that way. Although, actually, we're viewing Trisha's screen, which shows the chat, which is being recorded in the oh. screen share. So. That's a good point. <laughs> when, when, we think, when we think to have the chat that, that way, but yeah, that's true. Okay. Well, there you go. I'll make it bigger. Well, I agree with Kyle's comment. We have a lot of low-end users that it's it's like a big deal just to post the syllabus <laughs> so and put something in resources so a really simplistic tool is helpful for them and then we know that at least their students can find it somewhere and a lot of our instructors don't who are not a lot but oh well i guess a fair amount who just teach face-to-face -face don't use lessons and wouldn't know to copy lessons and wouldn't understand why they would if they wanted their syllabus to be copied so it's nice to have a tool that would be simple and that's why i wasn't thrilled with the 10 version of the syllabus sorry those who love it um because it was it's complicated now for our our <laughs> low-end users to use So this is Jolie. Um, I agree with all of that. <laughs> Meaning the, you know, having a, a, a way to leave a syllabus link in the menu is a good idea because people are used to that. Um, seems like we could sh should be able to come up with a pretty simple solution. I wonder if, um, you know, if we're going to suggest that people upload their syllabus to resources, which I know a lot of people do that as well. Um, I know that there's a way to make something um, a web content link in um, resources. I wonder if that's something that we could do with a default syllabus folder or something. I don't know. Um, that's a possibility of making it like super drop dead simple. Um, I'm also wondering if there's a possibility of the lessons template like Dave Evelyn was suggesting um, to make that available and just pre-configured for that specific type of thing. Just two ideas I'm throwing out there. I, I, I don't know the exact path forward, but um, I think we can I think we can come up with something. We just need to be clever about it. I think we even have tools available to us that we could just tweak a little bit. I guess one of the challenges I see to replacing the syllabus tool is confusing our faculty <laughs> and you know because they're just going to go back and look for it and and then it's not going to be there and they'll have to learn something and they'll be super annoyed with us so it sounds like there might be a requirement to have whatever solution that's come up with appear as though it is an actual separate tool, even if it's leveraging something else in Sakai. Mm. That's what I was proposing, Neil. That way, from obviously from the instructor's perspective, it, it looks like there is a separate tool, so. The idea about the
Whoops. Sorry. Harry, we, we lost you. <laughs> we lost you. Uh, the thing about the template is, um, the idea about the template is that then you have a chance of having a syllabus that is designed more meaningfully than just a simple Word document. It, it, saying, you know, class collapsible sections and that kind of thing allows a student to quickly search through a syllabus to find the relevant section. If he's having to scroll through pages and pages and pages of stuff just to get to the weekly schedule, whereas th that, that creates a problem, whereas if you've got those collapsible sections and you can see, okay, there's the section that has the weekly schedule and I click on it and it opens up. Um, it's it's a much easier navigation method for the students. Um, and that's where the advantage comes into having something like a lessons page template. That's the advantage of having this the syllabus tool that we have now, but nobody, it's rarely used that way uh, because it takes time to set it up and put it in there. But the advantage to the student in creating a more navigable syllabus is is a, is a great advantage for the student. Um, but I don't know how you get teachers to think about the syllabus as something but a Word document. Right. I think that's going to be a huge challenge. So this if, is this if, is Josh. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to ask whether uh, the results of what faculty members and instructors post in the syllabus tool in the syllabus tool, uh, you know, whether those results are sufficiently accessible for screen readers? No, they're not. Um, and I, I do, this is, this is kind of the main thing that I do. They are not accessible because it's just whatever Word document or whatever, and if they've got charts and graphs and tables and all that kind of stuff, they do not add alt text to any of it. Um, and that just all needs to be addressed and it's, it's not, um, Unless it's a straight text and there's nothing extra in there, which is not very common either, uh, because they're always putting in tables for the weekly schedule or for the grade scale or whatever, and those need to be addressed for accessibility. So you're right to bring it up. I mean, I guess where I'm going with that is that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, this is an opportunity to do something that pushes in the direction of accessibility, even if it requires a little bit more faculty education, because that education would be in the service of a, of a larger good. Right. I'm with you on that. I think a lot of this conversation that we're having and a lot of the chat, which I am not going to read out loud, I'm sorry. Um, it's it's just too much, and I and, and you don't want to hear me do that. Um, I think we're answering some of the other questions that um, we have seeded for this conversation, which is great. Um, <clears throat> so, could I put in my pitch for NGDLE? Yeah. Please. All right. So, and this is this is not a Sakai PMC. I'm not representing anyone, I'm just represent. this is my personal opinion, thinking about NGDLE um, and where what that might mean for Sakai. Uh, my personal vision in this moment for NGDLE is that Sakai um, have less overall code so that it's easier to maintain and the parts we maintain are easier to maintain really well with an incredible user interface and accessibility and internationalization translations and that it provides a really wonderful ways of easily integrating external tools because I think that's kind of the direction of NGDLE and the building blocks and what that means to me is that the more stuff we can get rid of you know in Sakai the better because then we jettison whole chunks of code that developers don't have to maintain where our UX team doesn't have to assess how to make the UX work better um, things like that so I just think that you know if we as a community sort of agreed on a vision like that, that might also help push us in, a, in particular directions in terms of both the individual tool decisions as well as kind of the broader um, aspect of what Sakai is about. That's my NG Daily pitch, pitch, and I'd love to have more discussion around it, um, not, not right this moment since we're focusing mostly on the syllabus tool. Yeah, 
Well, but I would affirm that, Neil, because the um, taking out the syllabus tool does not decrease functionality within Sakai. There are other th ways to present the syllabus in Sakai besides the syllabus tool. It's just, it's just extra stuff. Yeah, I mean, aside from the fact that it's surfaced in the the tool menu on the left, I haven't really heard anybody argue for any of the features that are in the syllabus tool, um, like the fact that it ties to the calendar or that it has the, the separate sections. Nobody's really saying we need those, um, so that, that kind of sounds like they're not necessary. Um, the same can be accomplished with a number of other you know, strategies. So I think it's it's kind of redundant in a lot of ways. I would definitely be in favor of, of getting rid of it if there's a, a way to still surface um, syllabus so that it's easy for, for faculty and students to find. Yeah, and, and obvious. <laughs> <clears throat> Yep, I and I agree. There was a com, you know, some comments back to you, Neil, in your conversation about NGDLE about um, simplifying the code for Sakai. Uh, there's a lot of agreement among us that that is a great idea, and getting rid of syllabus might be a step in a good step in that direction if we can figure out how to, you know, do that in a way that faculty and students are not freaking out and right. getting angry with us. Right, which, oh, go ahead. I was going to. But you could have a, 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 kind of going along with what Dave said, you could have a, a universal syllabus tool that is really just a modified, a template rather, that is really just a modified lessons page and it could come up as a separate tool, but it's it's a lesson page and it functions like a lesson page and you can do the sections and you can, you know, as far as coordinating with the calendar, the assignments and, and whatnot, the different tools do that separately anyway, those come up in the calendar. So that's kind of a redundancy. Yeah. So, you know, you could still have a syllabus tool, but it would just be, we know it's behind the scenes, it's a lessons tool <laughs> so it's just a lessons page named syllabus right it shows up by default right right or you get to pick it in your tool if that i mean i don't it depends i guess on people's workflows and what will freak out their instructors or not right or what the right. change management process is around that yeah thinking about those mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. like, yeah. It's, yeah. oh gee the sakai 12 syllabus tool looks a lot like a lesson page okay you know Good. yeah <laughs> Done so, it a long time ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think it might be interesting to think about what the next steps would be, um, you know, like for this discussion, since we're not going to totally solve it now, like could we have some mock-ups about what that would look like so we could think about the workflow and maybe it's a farm project and maybe it's not even a very expensive one. You know, maybe, maybe, we, can get a, maybe we can get an estimate from one or two, you know, commercial affiliates or something and see if, if they have time for it and, you know, figure out how, how will we make it happen and does the community have buy-in on it and stuff like that. Yeah. I like that idea. So Becky, and, and see there's, and there's still, I think, op options for other strategies. Like, you know, in the chat, Becky writes, I'd rather add it to resources, lessons is overkill. So, you know, I think there there's still room for discussion if we're clear on like what the requirements are, what the workflow looks like, what kinds of things are we trying to prevent kind of risk, right, of people freaking out. And then, and then we could even do a pros and cons on different approaches to achieving the same ends and see what the community as a whole, you know, likes the best. And, and can people live with one or the other, you know? Well, and some of it comes down to the, the local institutions and how they have um, their course creation templates set up. Because you can designate a course as a template for new courses that will give you kind of the standard set of tools that always show up by default and things like that. So, I mean, you could put, um, you know, a resources link in there called... Uh, 
syllabus that links to a syllabus.html page in resources and just sort of educate your your users that that's where they go to to edit their syllabus or you know you could have it be a lessons page or something else so some of it could be accomplished um, just by setting up templates within the institution hi this is karen um I, one one thing i'll point out is that when we train our users the very first thing we train them to do is how to upload their syllabus because that's a minute that's like something a minimum thing that a user might do and um and i would love for that to be super easy and not to be and to be really almost self-evident because i like for them to have an early win when they start using other tools and i do like the idea that was mentioned about using scaled down syllabus tool code to to be the new syllabus tool and it would could be the same code maybe scaled back and the users wouldn't even know it was the same code as someone mentioned that they just go oh this this has the same functionality as lessons with without as many bells and whistles or something like that anyway some good ideas i heard Yeah, so I'm hearing two different things. One might be, you know, what comes out of the box, right? What's out of the box, Akai, when you when you started off, and then, then there might be some documentation and some some training in the community and knowledge sharing about, hey, there's all these kind of cool ways that, you know, one way might work better for your institution if the out of the box way isn't the ideal for you for you. But we don't want to necessarily try and cover every single use case for every single institution, since institutions may do some of these things in different ways. And that'd be kind of hard to, to meet that, you know, meet all those different variations. But I'll shut up now. And we're also getting, I think, close to the end, Tricia, right? Yeah, we, got we are. So um, we had some suggestions for um, creating some mock-ups. I don't know if anybody on the call is interested in uh, sort of owning that and um, <clears throat> coming up with something. But if so, that, that would be um, a good next step. Oh, Louisa. Looks like, so are you volunteering then, Louisa, to do like a little bit of a mock-up? <laughs> All right. Hooray, Louisa. Very cool. So could you let us know when that when that's completed and then we can schedule for you to present that back, Louisa? And yeah, those sound like interesting ideas. Um, you know, lesson supports export and import of of common cartridge. So if people did design some template within lessons. Uh, you know, those could be easily shared and possibly some feature added to, you know, have them in the default interface, you know, like a drop down, like create from this syllabus package, create from this, whatever other package the instructional designers design. So developers aren't instructional designers, so. That. so that's an interesting feature that could. Repl definitely replace syllabus, I think. Okay, so, um, okay, great, Louisa. Louisa is, um, I've invited her to, to at least show us what she's got in the September 6th meeting, not as the main topic really, but, um, but just to keep the conversation going and, and us thinking about it. So we can devote probably 10 or 15 minutes to that, and hopefully that won't impinge too much on our group management discussion. Is that okay with everyone? Okay. Thanks, Louisa. Sounds good. Well, we have about six minutes left. And, uh, I really appreciate all the engaged discussion around the syllabus tool and, and what might be possible. And I think we we still have some ideas to explore 
and um, conversation to have around all of this, and, and we'll just see where where it goes. So now, thank you, Josh, for um, agreeing to be our main topic and speaker on the 6th. So that fills us out for that, for that pleasure. date. And September 20th, we're going to have another Atlas winner, Denise Comer from Duke University, um, talking about her um, composing internship experience using social media and digital discourse. That sounds great. And we have a couple of openings in October. Um, I know Matt, Burgess was talking to Jolie and Sean Foster about um, talking to the group about, uh, now I can't remember what, Jolie. <laughs> That's terrible. Sakai so UI inventory, which will be, Thank you know, you. it's pretty much done, but we'll be at a different point and uh, we'll be able to just report out. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I, I can't remember what date we decided on. Yeah. I if don't we, did. we did decide on one. Oh, well, we should do that. Maybe October 4. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to be out of town. I can't do that. Okay. Well, we'll touch <laughs> oh, base <dear>. email. <laughs> okay, sounds good. And figure it out. Uh, anything else? Uh, anybody else have any uh, topics that they would be interested in willing to present in October? Or maybe we need to come back to the syllabus discussion um, some more then? Um, what do you guys think? Well, in, in terms of uh, uh, topics, one of the things I'm aware that I think I kind of have the ball on um, that there was some interest in is Jira Paloozas, uh, which is, you know, teaching and learning issues that are in Jira for Sakai. Um, those don't have to be on the, you know, October 4th or 18th. We can use those for other things, but it does feel like I'm overdue to schedule uh, Jira Palooza. Okay. I think we need to kind of have them in a regular once a month or so, or once every six weeks to keep to keep things going on that. I'm going to put Jira Palooza with a question mark on the 4th. Okay. And um, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Because sometimes what I've done is is just schedule them in off weeks, you know, so the same time slot, Wednesday at 10 a.m., but on a week when there's no um, teaching and learning meeting, so it doesn't conflict. Mm -hmm. I've done that as well, and that, that seemed more like it can work, too. So, Louisa, you've asked a question about the collaboration features in Sakai. In, what's the context there? Are you still on the call specifically about sharing pictures in Sakai? Oh, as a topic? <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot of conversation going around about um, sharing official student photos and in various tools and how that's handled as well. That's a, that's a really good idea. Okay, Neil, thank you so much. I will stop the recording. All right, I'm going to add that. Um, to October 18th, and we might just make that a, a wider group discussion. All right, unless somebody comes up with something more concrete. Okay. Well, I think we've pretty much covered what we can in the time that we have, So, and folks are starting to drop off. So I want to thank everyone for the great uh, insights and input into the uh, syllabus discussion and looking forward to the group management conversation uh, next time. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to let you go, and we'll talk next time.